per tablet at KFMA.com. You want it? You got it. Reality Radio done right. right. No nonsense, real and raw, just like you like it. He's corrupt, he's inexperienced, and he lies. Broadcasting from a broom closet in the Arizona Lotus Studios, it's Beef Vegan Presents. Yo, welcome back to the show. It's Beefy Good Presents live from Rock 2.1 KFMA stream and worldwide KFMA.com on this beautiful Thursday, April 4th. Good morning, Rico. Good morning. And good morning, Tucson. Boy, do we have a show for you, man. Oh, there's so many things to get to. So little time. Uh, and uh, Rico just blew my mind. And now uh, we're going to make this uh, a piece and a segment here a little bit later to kind of feature some clips but you know just actually over the weekend uh, over 200 artists uh, signed an open letter urging uh, congress and lawmakers to get a hold of this ai right uh because it's out of control and uh, they're afraid it's going to take their jobs and i'll tell you what uh, over the course of the last 48 hours rico utilizing this software that is available to the public uh, turned into uh, basically the love child of Taylor Swift and Dr. Dre. <laughs> this guy's been cranking out hit song after hit song, and it is insane. They're going to send John Connor after me pretty soon. I'm telling you, man. Oh, no. And, and uh, these songs are getting whipped together in like 20 seconds. Uh, there's a theme song that we put together, like kind of K-pop style and anime style. That's on our social media pages. So if you get a chance, uh, you can check out Unreal Rico or at Beef Vegan on Instagram to see uh, basically the Beef Vegan theme song <laughs> along with images, everything AI generated. The Saturday again. morning cartoon, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, uh, I'm sure powers like uh, mind blue, like blue <laughs> when that happened. Um, and then we were talking about different songs to come up with. And I said, well, you know, uh, one of our little ideas that I have is because we just talked about yesterday how uh, the sweet tomatoes that opened up on April 1st here in town is a big deal online because it's the only sweet tomatoes in the entire world. So they're, they're kind of restarting the franchise here in Tucson. And I'm so he, happy you told me that, too. I was like, what's the big deal? I'm like, who cares about sweet tomatoes? I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a novelty. Yeah, right. Because it got shut down during pandemic and, you know, because it was an all you can eat buffet and those things are gross when it comes to germs. <laughs> Uh, but it's been a couple of years since removed and other buffets are up and running. So Sweet Tomatoes is back in the game. And for whatever reason, they said that Tucson is the place that we're going to be able to grow this <laughs> all over again. Like, we'll take it. Yeah. So I was talking to Rico about, you know, possibly going down there, shooting a video and getting some clicks on YouTube just doing that because that's kind of a big deal. And uh, while we're talking about what different ideas for AI songs to make, I was like, well, make a Sweet Tomato song, right? And the song that he just cranked out in 20 seconds, dear Lord, man, we dear can Lord. sell it to him. You own the rights <laughs> to this song, right? It's mine. Yeah. Okay. So here's the deal. Uh, instead of talking about it, I'm just going to play it for you. Uh, prepare to have your mind blown. <laughs> this is not a commercial, by the way. And I have to state this is not a commercial, but it sounds like a goddamn commercial. Like I want some sweet tomatoes now. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, man. Oh so this is the sweet tomato theme song, basically an indie rock. In the heart of the Desert city, so unique. To our oasis, a place where dreams could be. Oh, yeah. We've got mountains and cacti, a landscape so vast. But there's one thing that sets us apart. It's something that will last. What's that? In this humble town, there's a gem you won't find anywhere else. Okay. Nowhere. A haven for silent lovers, a taste that you can't help. Go on. Sweet Tomatoes is the name, a place that brings delight. With fresh greens and veggies, it's a foodie's pure delight. Ooh. Our Sweet son. tomatoes in Tucson. What? Is this not a commercial? Oh! And a guitar, guitar break. Guitar I, solo. This this thing got cranked out right before my eyes in like 20 seconds. So <laughs> it is mind blowing. And I'm not even a salad guy. And I want a salad now. Right. And uh, since you subscribe to the service, you own the. 
for this cause. Right. Yeah, so we really see a song of big commercial. Uh, it's crazy. Again, a back to the top story. Around 200 artists, including Katy Perry, Billie Eilish, uh, Pearl Jam, signed an open letter warning about the threats of AI to the music industry. And I fear that it's far too late because they already have these programs. They're selling and, their yachts right now. Yeah. Like, sorry, Katy Perry. That sweet tomato song slapped. <laughs> and, uh, you know, even Left Shark would agree. And that singer does what we want at all times. A- on a whim. given time. Any given time. In 20 seconds. On the toilet terrifying yeah. uh yeah that's the world that we live in but th- that's just the tip of the iceberg of the fun that we're having with ai today and we have a lot of other great stories including tickets for the black keys uh, that's going to be happening later on in the show as well so lots of things to get to let's kick off with some music we got your morning more coming up after blink 182 we got some uh, metallica to start off your morning phone lines are open if you want to give us a shout or suggest any kind of AI remix songs you want us to cultivate for you, go ahead and give us a call. 600 KFMA, 605362. This is Sabbath True on Rock 12.1 KFMA. You know the name of the show, Tucson. Let's go. All right, very Sweet energetic. Tomatoes, a taste beyond compare. Yeah, you're reading oh, lyrics. So and good. then you read our mind there, Jeff. Yeah, do a Sweet Tomatoes video and use it as a music video. I'm like, yeah, that's 10,000 clicks right there, dude. Uh, massive is huge. Uh, I so, want that sweet, sweet tomatoes money, baby. Yeah, Come and you've on. been having a ton of fun with this new program. You are essentially you're turning into a music producer. I was plugged and, in. Yeah. So, what is uh, if you were to like just cherry pick uh, your favorite songs that you've cultivated so far, and just in the last forty eight hours, how many songs do you have in your catalog? Oh, geez. Yeah, and I'm talking about all the ones that you're throwing away. I'm talking about the ones you're like, I could do some with this. Oh, oh, like good ones. Yeah. Probably like 10, 12. 10 or 12. Yeah. Okay. Out of 500 that churned out. I'm like, no, robot, try again. <laughs> That's an album in 48 hours, right, you know, right. straight up. Uh, so in this this open letter that is written to Congress from all these American musicians, again, is too late because they're all just like, wait a second. No, I, I've seen these programs and they're kind of coming up with really catchy and original music. And the way that it's doing it, too, it's not just like copy and paste, like 484 as far as bars and schemes are concerned. Their changes and their breakdowns that it's already starting to show uh, has been mind blowing. You're like, wait a second. That that seems like that has to be human written. Uh, But no, it's not. It takes the entire catalog of popular music uh, into a database, breaks it down and then predicts and cultivates uh, different arrangements on demand. And it's already mind blowing knowing this is just like the level one, you yeah. know, or like the very early beginning stages where it's going to only get more advanced and terrifyingly accurate. Yeah. And on the podcast broadcast, you guys know this. We were talking with Johnny Congos and he gave this very cryptic warning, basically saying it's over for songwriters. It is done. Uh, and you have to be something so far outside the box to prove that you are human. And that doesn't even necessarily mean it's going to be good. <laughs> I'm already seeing it's it's interesting too because I'm already seeing this guy I follow an old friend that's like this entrepreneur business guy but he's like every time he does a Facebook post at the bottom he's always like by the way this is not AI assisted this is all me writing all this out like it's a stamp of like authenticity which uh, I feel like music's going to probably adapt to that or any art in general is going to be like by the way 100% human yes <laughs> this is certified human you're going to have to legally uh, d- disclose this uh you know for both and there's going to end up being like two different music charts. There's going to be the human cultivated music chart and the AI cultivated music chart. Uh, and I guarantee you, we will have like a radio AI song, hit song on the radio before this year's over. It's impossible not to. Even that Drake album that came out sounded better than Drake. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, what the hell? Rock one, two point one KFMA. We're talking about the, you know, uh, the craziness of AI cultivating software that is creating popular music and doing it such a good job. It's terrifying to artists. It's terrifying to listeners alike. Uh, but we're also, you know, kind of joyfully uh, <laughs> playing Enamored. around with it ourselves. And Rico actually put together a theme song for this very program utilizing this AI software and then went to other AI uh, platforms to come up with images to create the music video for Beef Vegan Presents. Now you can only see the video on the podcast broadcast stream, which we're currently live on youtube.com slash Beef Vegan. Uh, but I want to share that with you right now. Uh, you may have seen a clip of this on Instagram, uh, but you'll see the full screen version on our YouTube stream at youtube.com slash Beef Vegan. This is the KFMA song. Check this out. Waking you up with a sonic glass. Turn up the volume. 
Man, future me is looking super Ooh. grizzled. That music video, like I said, you can only see youtube.com slash bfegan. Uh, so we're going to keep the conversation moving on the podcast broadcast. When we come back, Jimmy Kimmel has added up to here with America and how filthy we are after a recent trip to Japan. We're going to break down that story. Plus, uh, the delusion calculator and Herb Strafford is going to be joining us. Keep it right here or join us, youtube.com slash bfegan. Here's Foo Fighters with the glass. All right, that's clear. Uh, wasn't that insane? That's and crazy. that was all again, Rico uh, cultivating uh, through uh, various AI platforms, mixing it all together, and Babuski. Babuski. Uh, yeah, you saw Mari in there. You saw Weirdo in there. Rico. Uh, first off, let me just say this my only complaint, and I have a complaint. Okay. You have a gripe? I have a gripe. Okay. Uh, first off, you, Mari, Weirdo, all looked fantastic. I look like a dystopian, grizzled future version of myself. How is that not badass? It is kind of badass. But also, you like, had glowing red eyes and you had a grizzled look like you've been through seven robot battles and skirmishes. That's true. And you're wanting something else? Well, see. Look at you. I would trust that guy. Would you trust this guy? Yeah, to lead us in battle. Okay, yeah. I mean, I guess I, I look like a Marvel villain or maybe hero. You know what? Um, now that you opened up Pandora's box, I'm gonna shit, I'm gonna give no. you some really really <laughs> no no cutesy ones. I think I look fantastic. Okay, uh, what do you guys think? You know, but okay, so that's the grizzled version of myself. And honestly, uh, I've been working a lot. And yes, it did sound like Lizzie Hale. Uh, and Lizzie Hale knows this. That's why. And here's the other version of me. I'm assuming, right? Yeah, you're with your hawk. Oh, nice. You got me with the hawk. Hawk blocking. Yeah. That's so funny. All right, so uh, this is me on a clean shaven day. And then uh, let's see. Rico looks good. Or right, that's back to me. Look at Rico. Uh, again, yeah, evil. I'm your second in command there. See? Yes. Yeah. And you know what? You look a little grizzled too. You yeah. know? Yeah. That's I've been fair. through some things. Prominent cheekbones. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm look, famished a little bit. Right here. That was definitely <laughs> got the, the mass gainer on that one. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Manny said, fuck it, make beef look Disney style. Oh, he's already done it. Yep. Yeah. All right, and then there's Mari. Look how hot Mari looks. You know, she she dig that. Uh, we all have evil eyes, and there's another version of Mari. <laughs> like, whoa, uh, super banging, and then Weirdo comes up here in a little bit. You should have got through Todd in there too. Uh, that would have been fun. Let's see, and look at Weirdo. Weirdo almost looks like she could cosplay as this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was pretty accurate. And so the way you do this is you take images of us and you upload it to the software and. And do all that? Yeah. So I went to like uh, Mid Journey with images. It's it's a lot of trial and error. Yeah, I'm I mean, sure. The, the end products, you're just like, that's after like two, three hours of just caffeine and just <laughs> going into the program and then getting that, moving that over to uh, another program, Runway, I think it's called. Yeah. And then using that to animate some stuff. Todd so. said, why does she have two headphones? And yeah, I guess you're... you never know when one might go bad. <laughs> She's always prepared. Always prepared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and honestly, Weirdo in studio usually does rock two headphones. Yeah. One of the headphones she uses to listen to uh, different songs for like Hummers. And then she has the studio headphones. So that's actually accurate. accurate. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, to, to do what Rico did, it takes a lot of patience. And also, uh, you can't use the free software. You have to upgrade. Uh, so he subscribes to these. Uh, there's another shot of Weirdo, which uh, she'll probably turn into a profile pic. Uh, that's a nice one as well. And now I want to see this cartoon show. Right? Yeah. It's I'm like, damn, I kind of want to see this now. Yeah, like but... your little ra you know, ragtag group of these futuristic dystopian characters. Yeah. You know, kind of like, mm, That's amazing. I'd watch it. Yeah. So you and your hawk. I just want to see that hawk tear apart some robots. Yeah, the some hawk Mad would, Max gangs. Like like I'm Peacemaker. Like I'm John Cena's Peacemaker. I have a, my own hawk as a sidekick. It always comes back to John Cena. Well, I mean, that's a fantastic show. Peacemaker. <laughs> I can't wait for the second season. Uh, 
get on the air. Rock 102.1 KFA. Welcome back to Be Vegan Presents. Rico and I are hanging out uh, before we get into the Jimmy Kimmel story. Uh, how delusional are you as a woman looking for that perfect man and uh, your Uh-oh. expectations? Well, there is a delusion calculator. Uh, so this is from a site called Keeper. It's a matchmaking service. And they created a preference calculator to show who's available with the traits in the dating pool that you desire. And statistically, how often, you know, how many people actually qualify for that? Users are calling it the delusion calculator because it reveals how delusional they are about finding someone who has all their preferences in a partner. And it uses 2022 U.S. Census data. OK, so mm. pretty much it's pretty accurate as far as, you know, uh, uh, talking about the basic things like 14 different traits, including age, salary, height, education and more. And basically, the more of those traits matter to you, the harder it is for you to find somebody. OK, well, as a six, five man with a billion dollars in my bank account, I have nothing to say to this. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's true. Uh, you forgot to mention your 14 inch dong. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, I just did. All right, Thanks, so babe. for someone who's not too picky and just wants to date a man between the ages of 25 and 50 with a bachelor's degree, well, 36% of men meet those standards. Only 36%, though. Uh, that's about 59 million eligible dudes, and that includes the ones who are already married, unfortunately. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I'm assuming a, a large chunk of that percentage is married dudes looking for a side piece. So I don't know <laughs> if that's what you're looking for. Uh, now, someone who's a little more selective wants to date a man between 25 and 35 who doesn't smoke, isn't married, or obese. I mean, seriously, looking for a unicorn here. Uh, <laughs> and is at least six feet tall and makes at least $70,000 a year, has a bachelor degree, and wants kids. Well, you only get a 0.162% of that population, meaning in the entire United States, only 260,000 men qualify. And every girl has that Jim Carrey gif in their head that, oh, you're saying there's a change. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so if you do find somebody who meets all those qualifications, then congratulations, you found like uh, the diamond in the rough, man, because they aren't out there. Now, say you want to date a woman between the ages 25, 35, who doesn't smoke, is in a beast, and is at least five feet tall with a salary of 7,000 minimum and has a bachelor degree and want kids, you're looking at 0.68%. So actually there's more women who meet that qualification than men. Well, well, well. Yeah, but if you're looking for a woman who doesn't have a kid from a previous relationship in Tucson, it's 0.0003%. <laughs> <laughs> Zing! Yeah. And finally, these calculations don't even c- include preferences for religion, physical features, and drinking habits, which will limit your options even more. So this delusion calculator is available at Keeper. Uh, so it's something to look up and see how delusional you are. <laughs> yeah. So if you were to look for a certain set of standards that you want in a person, in a person, yeah, a well, partner, a partner, right? Yes. And what are you looking for? No social media. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, there's three qualified there. Uh, They're all over the age of 80, though. Is that okay with you? (laughs) Yes. All right. Perfect. All right. Keeping the conversation moving on the podcast broadcast. Herb Stratford's coming up next, and we're going to give spill the tea on why Jimmy Kimmel has a problem with the U.S. uh, on the podcast broadcast stream. Join us, youtube.com slash be vegan, or keep it right here on Rock One 2.1. Clear. All right. So what's 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 their names? (laughs) <laughs> Agnes, Agnes, Edna, yes, and then what's Ruth. your grandmother's name? She's one of them. <laughs> Nana, Mary. Nana Mary. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, uh, but you know what? I hear she's a freak. All right. So uh, Jimmy Kimmel, you tell me about this. What? Ha- I like this piece from. Oh, it's Fox News. So it starts off with liberal talk show host Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess that's accurate. But uh, I talk show host would have worked out as well too. Tell me who's not a liberal talk show host. I mean, between your options, uh, John Stewart, Stephen Colbert, Jimmy Fallon. Uh, let's see. John Oliver, Seth Meyers. All of them hyper liberal. Well, you can assume, right? So which one? Yeah. Who's the conservative talk show host as far as on a major network? There isn't one, right? Uh, and, and Years ago. Yeah. Nothing and- on OAN counts. Okay. That's a fact, mm. right? Uh, Bill Maher is the closest that you're, that conservatives are going to get, uh, and he's not conservative. All right, so tell me what's going on with Jimmy Kimmel, there, Rico. I just saw the article pop up. It's basically just going down the fact that he went to Japan recently, and it's like everybody you talk to who does visit Japan probably talked to Mari even about it. It's true. I mean, there's that thing going on with uh, the cleanliness they got there. Yeah, every bathroom is sparkling. Every street is clean. Um, 
But I guess it's, yeah, he's going to come back and look at L.A., of course. The right. Cesspool of America. Cesspool is the and, most accurate way to describe it. Most people uh, immediately say cesspool when driving down like Hollywood Boulevard and seeing all the homeless people and whatnot. But I think that probably goes for a majority of U.S. cities in general. Just yeah. like overrun, overpopulated, just dirty, you know, no regulate. But also it's like a cultural thing in Japan. I mean, sure, it's very homogenous culture and it's all just very they're all like very in line with keeping things clean exactly. on the same page here mm -hmm. it's just like somebody will take care of it who cares it's all very individualistic yeah so i mean uh, like there's a lot of different uh factors i guess that would go into this with uh the japanese culture which you kind of named uh, there's a respect for your surroundings that is kind of instilled in the citizens that we don't necessarily have here now i would say it's because of our you know free thinking society but you know japan's a pretty democratic country as well they're pretty free uh, as far as the people are concerned uh, they just continue to keep it clean. Now, they have their faults for sure, but uh, cleanliness is not one of them. Let me ask you this. It's kind of funny. The other day, I was, I think, on the, another show or something, they were mentioning the Fukushima meltdown. Yes. It, it, there was that very heartbreaking but very sort of like warming story about the older generation volunteering to go into the reactor to help clean up things because they said, we're going to die soon anyway. This is to help the next generation. Yeah. I was like, wow, that's very, you know, it's very heartwarming, impressive, sad. Yeah. But I'm like thinking like, if this happened in America, like, <laughs> how many boomers? You're like, no, no, no. I still got that vacation money. I'm not gonna. Yeah. Nobody, Sorry, kids. nobody that makes over a hundred thousand right. dollars a year. That's for sure. Anyone that's financially set is not going to be a volunteering this, but lots very of poor small, and yeah. old people would probably volunteer to do that for like, sure. Hmm. I, I know. Uh, I, uh, so, okay. We got a couple things. So speaking of uh, Japan, the, of course, Taiwan had their earthquake. Did you see footage of that? I heard about it. I didn't see footage. Yeah. So it could have been worse. And that's one thing. One, uh, the one piece that I saw, which was wildly fascinating. They have a building in Taiwan that's 101 stories, right? So you would think this one's going to just, you know, crumble to the ground mm -hmm. with a magnitude uh, 7.4 earthquake. But they, the way they constructed this and engineered it, they have what's called a golden sphere in the center of this building. So when oh. the earthquake started happening and moving the building, the sphere would rotate in the opposite direction, keeping it upright. Like a camera stabilizer. Yes, dude. <laughs> what's that called? Gy gyrocentric uh, here. There's a word, uh, but that's cool. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, dope. terrifying. Yes. But yeah. All right. So uh, here, I want to share this. So people in Taiwan have posted a bunch of crazy footage about the earthquake yesterday. Initial reports said nine people passed away. Uh, the, the number is expected to go up, but again, still not as catastrophic as it could have been. Uh, it triggered a massive landslide and people had to be rescued. Uh, and this is a video of said rescue that I'm going to share with you here, um, which is, again, Fascinating. Let me set this up. Well, here, I'll tell you what. We'll have, we'll show you that. We'll have Herb Stratford in. And uh, let me just get to our morning moron today, which was a doozy. And in case you missed it, went a little something like this. One more time on Rock 1 2.1 KFMA. Now 6.15 in time for your morning moron. Let's do this. Oh, the hangry morning morons out in the world, always making headlines. Uh, sometimes they get hangry and upset for the most ridiculous reasons, like getting a sweet deal. Have you ever been pissed off uh, beyond comprehension when somebody saves you money? No. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Unless it's like reverse psychology trying to get a better deal, but that's ridiculous. Yeah, well, the cops in Cleveland are trying to figure this out as well, as they've been <laughs> trying to track down a guy who pulled a gun on a Burger King worker because his breakfast costs less than expected. What? Yes, dude. So he was like, I'm expecting to pay $8, and you're telling me it's $6? Somebody's going to die. He thought he was being tricked. Yeah, dude. So it happened on Easter. He was in the drive-thru and ordered a sausage biscuit, hash brown, and two sausage, egg, and cheese croissants. All of them sound delicious here. Oh, yeah. uh, his order came out to around $8, but he told the employee that it should be more like 11 <laughs> Right now... 38-year-old Howard Vernon uh, was working the drive-thru, okay? So he's a 38-year-old Burger King worker. Zero Fs to give. Uh, he explained to the guy that they were running a deal, so it was less than usual. But the guy started yelling and swearing and eventually sped off. He was infuriated that he was about to spend less than he expected to pay. <laughs> None of it makes sense. <laughs> and then he came back about a minute later. This time he came with a gun. Oh. He pulled up next to another car, got out, and pointed a gun directly at Howard's face. 
Now, he says that the guy threatened to kill him and also used a racial slur. But Howard, a 38-year-old Burger King employee, figures he has nothing left to lose, didn't flinch. <laughs> He's like, dude, what are you going to do? do you, yeah, I'm, I'm do begging it. you. Because what do I, guess what I'm doing tomorrow? I'm waking up and I'm coming back to Burger King. So end this sweet pain right now. Oh, God. Anyways, yeah, he just stood there until the guy left. And last we heard, cops were still looking for him. Now, Howard told a reporter it's pretty nuts and you know, that someone would get mad about, you know, the breakfast costing less, adding that he doesn't know why people are so angry at 9 o'clock in the morning. Now, I get it. You're cranky uh, and you're hangry. Uh, but at the same time, that's good news, dude. You know, when it costs wow. less money, that's good Jeez. news. There's video that you're going to be able to see on the podcast broadcast oh of this dude pointing a gun point blank. He does it very cinematically, too. Yes, he does. And again, Howard, the, the Burger King fast food employee in Cleveland, is just like, do it. Yeah, please. I mean, you're only doing me a favor. You don't point. mess with a Howard. Yeah. A 38-year-old fast food worker. Be like, look, I've made a lot of <laughs> bad life decisions and uh, right here. So all you're doing is offering a way out. So he's yeah. full Sam Jackson in Pulp Fiction. He just has that look. He's just like, <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, but to recap, okay, uh, first off, discounts are a good thing. OK, uh, getting mad and threatening to end somebody's life over them, giving you an order that's three dollars less than you expected. <laughs> it makes you a morning moron. Hey. All right. <laughs> welcome. Welcome, Herbie. You like that? Morning <laughs> I do, man. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. Burger King Fury. Yeah, that was a doozy. And, and again, well, I've said on the show many times, you just don't mess with fast food workers, right? They, they don't care. And they're at a point where you don't know. And when someone you're interacting with somebody, you know where you don't know where they're at emotionally. Uh, they're just waiting for an excuse. Yeah, dude. Just be like, I've, I've been at rock bottom so long. You know? <laughs> like, oh, there's more. You keep my digging. shift ends early today. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> please. If you punch me in the face, it might actually feel better than the pain I feel inside <laughs> on right. a regular basis. That's right. They just leave. They're like, wow, dude. Yeah, <laughs> I'm done. Ken, what's going on at the rock that's worth mentioning? Give me uh, the comment of all the details, and then I will. Uh, share that on the podcast. I know I, I did get hit up by Brent, who hosts a, a reggae show called uh, Vibes Alive. Last night, saying there was a, a reggae show at The Rock, but I didn't go out. I have a meeting today and, and whatnot. Uh, of course, we got Herb here. We're going to talk about movie previews, and we're going to show off our AI abilities. We've already been having so much fun with this AI. Rico, I, I know, is probably going to make you a theme song. I already he's, have one. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> did you send me the email? Not yet. I'm still going to. I'm testing them out. Okay, yeah. So he's I'm got in a studio just listening yeah he's got to pick the perfect one which is fair okay uh I'll, I'll show you this video that i was teasing about the uh taiwan earthquake here uh just this was a crazy video that's going viral on twitter and of course you i'm sure you saw some clips from that earthquake right oh yeah it's terrifying i can't that that building tipping is just i can't even and this is that Whoa. tip building there's really one building that has suffered the most damage and that was the one where like the, the bottom kind of collapsed on itself and it turned into Jeez. like the leaning tower of pisa yeah. uh, th these are emergency responders uh rescuing people out of that b building wh which could fall in any moment right <laughs> look at that that's oh. the building it's, it looks like something out of science fiction. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't uh -huh. even look real. Out of Inception or something. Yes, exactly. And there's people, obviously people survived that lived in that building. And just imagine that as far as, you know, you're, uh, say, on the eighth floor. And now everything's tilted and you look out the window and you're like, what the hell? You know, and you're not getting your stuff back. No. <laughs> so And they're going to increase rent because it's cool now. Well, yeah. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that's true. And they keep it's it there. Hot spot. Building. Yeah, exactly. That's true. <laughs> Damn it. Did you go to Taiwan at all during your trip? Uh, I stopped there. It was a layover. Oh, uh, just a layover. Taiwan, yeah. yeah. So you didn't get to see it. During the heightened tensions. So I'm like, please don't pop off while I'm here. Yeah, yeah. I'm good. Well, uh, you know, they didn't just Mother Nature did. Right. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, I'm going to share that clip that you did with the uh, interview clip that you did with Dakota oh, Fanning. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then oh, we cool. also have the clip of the heist of the century that happened on Sunday. Uh, which is just crazy. You saw that. The I, heard, news on I that? heard about it. I haven't seen the clips, though. Oh, uh, you know, we went through the details, the bullet points of this. And, you know, like, again, I don't celebrate criminal culture by any means. But when something is vastly oppressive like this, you're just like, wow, hats off. This is something right out of a movie. Yeah. And you guys had your shit together to say the very least. I mean, this is, uh, you know, who knows? 
uh, how many people were involved in this, but it had to be multiple people. They got thirty million dollars in cash, which we did the math on that. <laughs> Asked uh, ChatGPT, it's heavy. Yeah, it's disputable, but it's a lot of weight. Yeah, yeah. because each bill costs at least a gram, uh, and that adds up, right? So uh, they went in through the the roof, undetected by security cameras and and uh, security alarms. Uh, and then to get out, they blew a hole in the side wall to be able to like exit and then load up the cash at their leisure, oh mind God. you, because this happened in the middle of the night on Easter when nobody was working because wow. it was a holiday. So then they loaded up $30 million worth of cash and then took off completely undetected as far as we know. Now, FBI is involved. I'm sure they're looking at security footage from every angle, from every single location within a three mile radius yeah. to see anything that might be large enough to haul $30 million. Yeah. And you would think with big brother technology, they could catch these guys. But what if they don't? How impressive would that be? Mm -hmm. You know? Now let's I, put her up on the spot real quick. Was it you? After <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. If you had a cast and put a director in charge of the movie version of this, Easter payday, who, who would be uh, who would be the director That's and who a nice would be name. in it? Nice thing. Well, and you know, uh, so in, as you're describing this, of course, I'm flashing back to my favorite heist movie of all time, which is Heat. Yes. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I mean, and the the when they're coming out of the bank and they're yeah, carrying seconds. all that weight. Uh, yeah. No, I'd like to see Michael Mann take this. There we on, go. You know, I mean, huh? he's the he's the. Is guy. He still alive? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Rock One Two Point One KF May. Welcome back to Beef Vegan Presents. We're joined by film critic extraordinaire uh, Herb Stratford. Good morning, Herb. Good morning. Uh, it's been a busy week for you. You've been uh, not only uh, seeing and reviewing a bunch of uh, things, but you've been uploading uh, numerous interviews on your YouTube page, Arts and Culture Guy. Uh, who's the last interview you just had? So we just did Adam Scott uh, and uh, and Dakota Fanning from Ripley. Which, yeah, you had uh, them together, huh? I did. Yeah, and that's nice. a hell of a get. It was nice. Um, they they actually. I was going to go to New York, but once they told me it was a five minute interview, I'm like, I don't really want to fly to New York for a five minute interview. <laughs> right. Can we do zoom? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So we did that, but no, that, that was sort of fun to, uh, to get that done. And I, you know, I know you hate when I do this, but that's why I'm going to do it. Uh, I've been watching fallout. Oh, oh, and that's not released yet. Oh, you son of a bitch. And that's going to be on Damn Amazon you. Prime. It is. It's on Prime, and it's next. I think it's next week. And it's there's eight episodes. I've watched the first two. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, usually when they do let uh, JOs like Herb Shafford watch ahead of time, <laughs> I am mad. Uh, it's usually a good sign, a good indication that they believe in the project and it's going to be really good. And, and we're going to go deep next week, but I mean, this is Christopher Nolan's brother, Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy, who did Westworld. Exactly. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm so, glad that you mentioned that because I would not let you uh, continue without mentioning that they are the creators of Westworld, which was fantastic. And unfortunately, we're, we were robbed of a final season. But did uh, you see the news yesterday? No. So Nolan was doing some interviews for, for uh, Fallout and he said that now there is talk about doing that fifth season somewhere. Do Whoa. it. Yes, we need that. And honestly, uh, let's hope that Fallout such a massive success for Prime that Prime's like, you know what? HBO, they pulled it. So you can't even watch old episodes of Westworld. Yeah. So we'll buy the IP or rent it or whatever you will in that business world. We'll air Westworld and we'll finance the fifth and final season. Babuski, I need conclusion. Well, and they said it was already written. And even the cast, I mean, everybody was like, oh, yeah, we were ready to go. And it wow. sort of hurt. Oh, know? yeah, dude. I'm so Crazy. pissed. I, honestly, what Warner, Warner Brothers has been doing the last 10 years, and I grew up on HBO, right? So, you know, um, they're breaking my heart over and over again. I'm like, are you trying to make me turn on you to where I would never, I will make sure that my grandchildren never support your <laughs> conglomerate. Because honestly, it that can happen. It yeah, can what happen. they're doing, it's like they're doing it on purpose just to like make us mad. They changed their name to Max to be cool and edgy. Yeah. Max and now they're acting like it. Max Hale. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, next week we're going to talk more about Fallout. But this week, uh, let's talk about Scoop. Scoop is the, or was it the one with Dakota Fanning and, um, so, well, that's Ripley. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's talk about Ripley real quick. Okay. Since you All did right. have the, that five minute interview with Dakota Fanning and Adam Scott, both are great actors and, and pick pretty good roles. Is this going to be on Netflix? Uh, it is on Netflix. And so you may remember the, the, the movie. There was a movie back in the 90s. It was Jude Law and Matt Damon and Gwyneth Paltrow before she went off the deep end. Okay. And it was based, it was called The Talented Mr. Ripley. That, yes. that was the movie, movie, right? So this is that same story, which is the 1955 book by Patricia Highsmith. 
Uh, and But it's expanded into an eight-part black and white, which is just beautiful. It's gorgeous. Uh, miniseries on Netflix and you get so much more character development because it's long form storytelling uh, and it's uh, and actually it's, it's Andrew Scott that's I'm screwing up when I say that um, oh it's not, yeah it, it, Adam Scott's the other guy yeah, uh, yeah Andrew Scott Dakota Fanning and Johnny Flynn and basically uh Andrew Scott plays a guy who's sort of a, a sort of a low level grifter and he ends up being sent to Italy by the father of this guy who wants to have, hey, you know him, bring him home. And right. so he goes, and of course he sees, he sees this guy, Dickie Greenleaf, he sees his life and he's like, well, I want that life, mm-hmm. right? So you know, basically that's the whole story of the like, and then of course the, you know, Dickie's girlfriend is, is played by Dakota Fanning and she's a little suspicious of this. And so it's, it's, it's very, very well done. And uh, it was great to have a chance to talk to them, but it's also just great to see a beautiful black and white piece. And so my interview, actually, they, they gave us the interview in color or black and white. And I like the black and white. One. Ah, of course <laughs> you did. You're like, this is what I grew up with. Ah, awesome. well, in fact, actually, we're going to watch a snippet of that interview on the podcast broadcast stream right now. YouTube.com slash beef vegan. When we return, there's a movie coming to theaters called Wicked Little Letters. What's that about? And is it worth watching? Herb Stratford's going to break it down after music from Saliva on Rock 1 2.1 KFMA. All right, so yeah, I got that queued up. Let's see the little black and white interview here. Classy. Yeah. Are you sick of having issues with I am. Your webinars? Hold on. Wasting- <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I just got to get commercials. Yeah. Uh, are, so you're monetized? I don't think so. Or if I am, they're getting the money. I'm not. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah, they screwed you. I, I, I don't have enough uh, followers, man. I know. You only got 94. So follow Herb if you're not already. Yeah. Uh, which I'm sure you guys are, but pl- uh, please follow them. A lot of streamers are, and thank you to streamers. They were commenting when I posted this earlier in the week. So thank you to the streamers for watching. So, yeah, we won't watch the whole thing because most of you probably already watched the whole thing. I uh, definitely want to see Dakota and Herb interact, though. Did you get creepy? That's the no. question. Oh, well, no, that's the question I'm asking. I'm looking for answers in this clip. So let's check it out. I'm Herb Stratford, and I'm in Tucson, Arizona at uh, KMSB and uh, NBC. So, Hi. hey, guys. Hey. hey. Nice to see you. Let me start with you, Andrew. Um, The cinematography of this series just blew me away. And seeing this world um, in Italy at this time period in black and white was just remarkable. And I know it was obviously a very sort of articulated uh, choice on on the part of the team. Were you looking at, at dailies and were you looking at that world in black and white? Or did you not really see that until later? No, I don't look at dailies. Um... It just makes me self-conscious. Uh, I never have, and I never will. Um, but we did know, of course, that it was going to be in, in black and white, and that was something that Steve was very, uh, that was part of his vision right from the get-go. And I think it just sort of, it, it's interesting because it sort of took me out of, um, of sort of distraction mode, and I was really focusing, I know you'd probably say, I want you to do this anyway, but I was focusing more on your eyes and on your smile and sort of the play of emotion around your face, mm. which I found easier to do when I wasn't distracted by all the colors and the beauty of Italy. Right. Yeah. But that's, that's very, that's a very interesting way of, of, of seeing it. We've been talking a lot about how it goes hand in hand with exactly what you're saying, which is to focus in on how we watch these people. Mm. Um, and I think that's visually what we're, that we're, we're sort of, we reduce what, what the, the, um, the, palette almost um literally and also with the pacing um that we're able to really focus in on things and actually it's almost like in, in, in sort of in, almost like um a meditation that there's sort of a meditative thing that when you go in and then we watch certain sequences with absolute focus and that's what we're, we're actually t- we're kind of taught how to watch it and i think the black and white and the pacing really helps that so dakota i wanted to ask you one of the things that i wanted so much more of was how much of your book did they actually create for the production? A lot. Because I was, I, I want to see it. <laughs> a lot. Steve had, Steve, there were pages and pages printed of the book. Yeah. Um, and I actually, uh, when I, I went in and recorded a bunch of, of the book. Yeah. And um, it was amazing. It was so fun to, to do. And just um, so Marge, the book was so Marge. Nice. So there you go. Dakota Fanning answering Herb Trafford's uh, clip. Make sure you see the rest of it. YouTube.com slash Um, 
Uh, nope. Actually, Art's a culture guy. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Nice <laughs> try, Beef. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm trying to squeeze in a plug. Now, Rico, you're going to debut a theme song for her before the end of the podcast, correct? Sure. Okay, good. I right, Now, earlier this morning, we talked about the heist of the century that happened last Sunday. We give you all the details in this clip right here. Check it out. 2.1 KFMA, welcome back to the show. Now, uh, there's every now and then you'll come across a news story that you're just like, man, this is straight out of a movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, this happened on Sunday in Los Angeles as a massive heist took place and thieves were able to get $30 million Jeez. in cash. Wow. Cash, dude. Cash money. Uh, and of course, this sounds like something straight out of Ocean's Eleven. And uh, the way that these thieves uh, stole the $30 million somewhat brilliant mm -hmm. you know you kind of have to applaud it uh now this happened at a money storage facility one of the uh on easter sunday right and then apparently this is a place where all those money trucks go and they store large sums of cash in vaults okay mm -hmm. so it's outside of a bank it's it's actually you know more valuable than a bank because banks don't have the space to store this type of money mm -hmm. uh, but this storage facility does and it has to be an inside job dude uh, now, it was uh, called the Garda World Facility, uh, and it's in the area of San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles. Okay, so what the thieves did is they broke in through a roof hatch, all right, and then they circumvented security systems, meaning they didn't trip them off. They didn't set off any security system. Hmm. They, they climbed up the ladder on the side of the building. They went through the roof hatch. They were able to not set off any alarms. Hmm. Okay, then what they did to get the cash out is they broke they basically busted a hole in the side of the wall i'll show you an image here uh, rico on the podcast broadcast stream because uh, you know there's a news outlet that showed this uh, three things so you see in this uh the ladder going up to the hatch uh the hatch where they will make it in and it does seem like it's pretty simple to break into the hatch uh well, and then easy. the hole in the side of the wall uh where they kind of blew out the wall because <sighs> I'll tell you what, immediately I was like, $30 million in cash, dude, that's a lot, and that's heavy. How much does $30 million in cash weigh? And I asked that question, and if it was all $100 bills, a $100 bill okay. is a gram, right? It's a math. Yes, exactly. Assuming it's all $100 bills, it, it would have weighed 661,000 pounds. <laughs> so this has to be a job. Of multiple people because or forklift yeah dude well uh, maybe there's a forklift inside but <laughs> at the same time yeah even putting that in the back of an f-150 that's a lot of weight dude right i've seen heat okay well oh, yeah see uh if this if these thieves end up getting caught then you know we want to know all the details how did they pull this off but the problem is a uh, similar heist happened uh like this before uh there's been heists that happen like this where the thieves haven't been caught and there's been heists uh that ha where thieves have been caught a comparable heist includes the 1997 dunbar armored robbery which was about 36 million dollars and uh, the the hot the hot garden heist in london in 2015. The first robbery I mentioned, the police still have not caught, caught those people. Hmm. Yeah, so that happened in 1997. As of, uh, uh, as far as the 2015 heist, uh, they did catch all those people, and they they all had nicknames that was straight out of a Quentin Tarantino film. <laughs> there was a Mr. Ginger. There was the old man. I mean, fascinating. The hacker, stuff. the driver. Right. Okay. They so got sloppy. Uh, business operators discovered the theft when they opened the vault on Monday. So there was a full day. Uh, they knew to go on Easter when nobody was working. Uh, of course, the police are, are collaborating with the FBI to try to solve the case, uh, and authorities suspect a crew was responsible. Yeah, no See, duh. I'm already disappointed, though. Why? Because it was on Easter, you said, right? Yeah. And they didn't dress as the Easter bunny? Like a crew dressed as bunnies? You don't know. Well, the thing no is... No cameras at all, huh? They, they were able to uh, not be caught on camera. As far as we know so far in the information that's given to us. Wild. Now, yeah. Uh, okay. So the thieves, uh, the theft follows a pattern of significant unsolved heists. Okay. Uh, so uh, the international comparisons like the Silmar robbery uh, draws comparisons to the hot and garden heist uh, due to its skill and method involving drilling through thick vault walls during a holiday period. So basically what this crew assuming, you know, there's no way that this was a single person job. Uh, they they knew how to get in. They had the means to be able to break into a vault. Then they had the means to be able to break through a wall, right? Like Kool Aid Man, Kool -Aid Man style. 
uh, which I don't know if they use explosives or not. Then they were able to upload over 660,000 pounds of dollar bills because it was all cash that they stole uh, and then drive off in the middle of the night undetected by authorities until the next day. Damn. Damn is right, dude. It like, sounds so impossible in 2024, but they did it. Exactly. And, and look, we don't applaud criminal behavior. Of course not. Okay. Right. But at the this same economy. time, you got to get credit where credit is due. <laughs> something is like mind-blowingly impressive that so, like a group of people can get away with something like this. And so far, they've gotten away. Right. And it's going to be even more difficult for them to track it down, right? Because it's cash. Mm. So it's not like you stole gold bars and those are all serial numbered and you'd have to like melt them down or any other type of like. Oh, a, they can track cash. They, they probably have them marked, but they can also do the laundering thing. They we can. watch a lot of TV, don't we? I, I think so. <laughs> uh, I can't wait to see the Netflix series on this. So, uh, so yes, that happened over Easter Sunday. Uh, while you guys were sleeping in and eating eggs, uh, there was a group of people out there getting over uh, $30 million uh, and working on their buys and tries because they were lifting up a lot of weight with Oof. over 660,000 pounds of cash. Now, I did get a call kind of angrily uh, from a listener being like, oh, I Googled it, and that's only 22 pounds per million dollars. And I'm like, well, you're using an outdated reference uh, source here because I use ChatGPT, and, and it does the math a little better, right? But at the same time, I don't know. i never seen a million dollars. But, but 22 pounds? He's saying a million was 22 yeah, pounds? Yeah. And $100 bills. Yeah, so oh. assuming that they're all $100 bills, which uh, you know is a safe assumption in a facility like that, uh, each hundred dollar bill weighs a gram, and so that adds up. And that's the one takeaway when you see like behind the scenes, uh, f like features talking about like heist things, like Breaking Bad. They talk yeah. about how heavy, uh, you know, money really is when yeah. you put it in a big duffel bag. You know, so to keep it realistic, you got to weigh it down. Like it's eighty pounds. You're just like, oh, this. Well, and like we were talking about heat earlier, like that scene when they're coming out of the bank and they're carrying the the duffel bags. It almost seems unrealistically light. Yeah, they're just like carrying it like a little knapsack. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and running, and it's like, no, man, that's a lot of weight. Yeah, that I think it was up. They were going for bonds though in that first scene. That's right. Oh, that's right. They can never mm. sell them back. Mm. Untraceable. I love that movie. It's a great uh, movie. It is, and you're movie. gonna make me want to rewatch it. Yeah. You know, what I like I like theme songs. And Rico came up with <laughs> nice uh, good segue. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rico came up with a theme song for Mr. Herb Stratford uh, that uh, we all me. Yeah, all, I spent all morning <laughs> writing, creating, hiring a band on Craigslist. You're fascinating. I oh, mean, yeah. what you've been able to do uh, with you know, the music work. lately. And you had no music talent before this. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, you are like Beethoven. He's mm -hmm. Mozart. He yeah. is Mozart. Yeah. A prodigy, they say. All right, so should I do Finest Critic or Son of the Silver Screen? <laughs> you can choose. I think both were good. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, check out Herb Stratford. I want to see it on his YouTube channel. Now we're going to do like a whole intro of him just watching movies with a pen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we a got whole you. intro. Send him to me. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> let's listen to this. This is AI Herb Stratford. There's a man in Tucson. Herb's his name. He's got a taste for classics. With no shame, he's seen every film from New York to LA. His words cut key, his knowledge on display. Heard comes the legends, the heroes, and the villains. Can dissect the plot with the precision of a surgeon. With his pen in hand, tell it like it is. His refuse of gold, his words can make or break a flick. He's hard. And we don't want him to fall too because he's at that age where yeah, life will be involved, you know. So. <laughs> All right, so that was the first uh, one. The second one we're going to play as we go into our on-air segment. Oh, so uh, we're going to debut official. essentially a new theme song for you. All right. As we talk about uh, the the next film project uh, that is coming to theaters. His reviews are going to be shorter bit, than the song. He's like, yeah, great film. All right, that's been heard. Uh, and then I go right back into the yeah. theme song. And then out, dude. So it would be fantastic. Wow. Uh, we're obviously having a lot of fun with this. So. You really so. Besides Fallout, and of course we're going to talk about Wicked Little Letters. Uh, what else have you been following here? 
that you're excited about? Uh, well, you know, I mean, honestly, uh, this is the weird time where you're starting to get some serious stuff, right? You know, yeah. like you're getting out of the the the, the late winter doldrums. Uh, but you know, Fallout's a big thing that's coming up. Uh, Monkey Man is dropping next week. That's the Dev Patel movie, I'm which looks for that. pretty freaking awesome. Nice. Uh, and then you know we've got uh, we've got the Rebel Moon Part Two, right? And Rebel Moon Part One failed miserably. And that's of course the <laughs> so Zack Snyder there. thing, right? Yeah. All right, hold on um, a second. Let's see your theme song. Uh, as we go in. A two songs got a film critic, a man named Herb. He's seen a thousand movies, he's got the final word. Yes, he does. He sits in the theater with the notepad in his hand. Nerd. Just like he's been spent playing. Oh, yeah. He's got opinions. And uh, that's film. Uh, that's film critic Herb Strafford's new theme song here. Oh yeah, Rock One Two Point One KFM. We are back with Herb, of course. We'll play the rest of this theme song in the outro. Uh, but let's talk about uh, the uh, film that you just reviewed in theater with a notebook, a uh, notebook, and a pen and pad. <laughs> Nerd. You know, I got to tell you, I've never done that. I've never taken notes in a theater. I will, I will write notes down later. But like, it's so funny to me. People, I'll, I'll sit with critics who do, and they're like, they can't see and they're like trying to write yeah what are they you know, scribbling like, down that doesn't make sense doing? you know so yeah it's just not good or if you hear him snoring next to you, then that's a bad sign. <laughs> yes, it yeah. is. No, now, uh, there's a, a, a one movie that's coming to theaters that's uh, prominent enough for you to feature, and it's called Wicked Little Letters. Yeah, this uh, movie is this is a funny movie. So this is a set in an English town between World War One and World War Two. So it's a period piece, and it stars Olivia Coleman as sort of this really uptight woman, uh, and Jesse Jesse Buckley, who is sort of the crazy new woman in town from Ireland. She has a young daughter. She's very brash. She's in the pub. She's playing darts. She's drinking beer. Uh, Olivia Coleman is very uh, straight laced, right? All of a sudden, Olivia Coleman starts getting these letters calling her horrible names. Oh, no. <laughs> right? Like, re like really, like really raunchy letters, right? So naturally, all the attention falls on Jesse Buckley because that's sort of like her persona. You're like, well, surely it's her. And she's like, I'm not writing these letters. And then other people start getting letters in the town and it's this big thing. And they like, you know, they arrest Jesse Buckley. And and then this, this uh, police woman decides that she's going to look into this. She's like, something's not right. Uh -huh. So this is a really sweet movie. It's really funny. A little bit raunchy, you know, just because these letters are hysterical. Uh, all the so they read them, and oh yeah, yeah, yeah you're reading, you're hearing all these letters. <laughs> so, and it, and the funny thing about this too is this is a true story. This actually happened in this small English town where everybody just lost their mind because people were writing letters. Because now we think about online bullying and everything, right? Yes. This mm -hmm. is going on in the 30s. <laughs> this predates that. Yeah. So it shows that, you know, human nature is that of like uh, an online troll. Yeah. And we've been <laughs> trolling before online was a thing. Uh, so this is basically the first documented uh well, we just saw a butt uh, first documented troll who terrorized an entire town just yeah. by talking smack. Yeah. That's, I'm impressed. It, yeah, it's it, it's it's a really sweet movie. So yeah, check check that one out if you if you're out and about. It's uh it's a good one. And as you mentioned, there is there is one butt in uh, in the movie. <laughs> it's only one butt though. Yeah. Oh, uh, so you can see that in the trailer. Yeah, that's true. Nice butt. And I'm sure I'm gonna get flagged on YouTube for that, but <laughs> worth it. <laughs> uh, that was the film review for Wicked Little Letters by our uh, our uh, resident movie critic, Herb Stratford. We're going to be back with your beef tip and talk about a scoop on the podcast broadcast streaming. You can join us YouTube.com slash Beef Vegan or just keep it right here because your beef tip's coming up next. Blockbusters to Indies, you see them all. It's the one they turn to when they need the call. Critic from Tucson. He's the best they ever had. With his wit and his insight, he drives the crowd mad. He was just like, wait a minute. He was just bought. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> How much uh, we talk? How many donuts exactly. do you have in the kitchen? Right, all right, right. All right. Great uh, film. That's only on Friday now, by the way. Oh, so, by the way, it just came in. Uh, it came in with me. What donuts in? Oh, so we actually have donuts on Thursday? Yeah. 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 That's good. I mean, I don't they know. Came, they came in the door when I came in. So. I'm a, a Zoom meeting with the consultant right at 10. So we steal donuts. donuts by the time. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess I could I'd grab a donut and just you could, eat. You could shame eat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it'll be any shame. Honestly, I don't really know what too much we're going to talk about, except for... It'll, it'll add to the swag, though. You bust in with a donut, eating it, like, all right, let's get this over with. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, first, uh, I'll start it off with I apologize for what I did in December and January. <laughs> I fucked up. Uh, fixed it. Uh, what about the show? You've been listening to the show? Uh, what do you guys think of the show? The show's I mean, been going good? It needs more butts. <laughs> it does need more butts, you know. A uh, weirdo actually, uh, she's putting in her two weeks because she accepted a full time position at Rustics. Oh, yeah, which is good for her, bad for us, right? But Mari's stepping up, um, and then Todd and we'll we'll continue to keep uh, our cast characters rotating. And I feel like I have a couple other ideas of how we're going to approach some of this stuff. Some of it's going to be pre recording some segments just so we can continue to keep personalities. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, like the last thing I want, the one thing I'm trying to avoid is doing a solo show, right? Because nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> Where's he going? Well, no, he's only I'm available two days. Yeah. He, yeah oh, okay. he, he values sleep more than opportunity. <laughs> and, right. uh, yeah, right. I so. get it. I get it. Yeah, no, I get it too. I've asked. <laughs> I'm like, what about now? Uh, locked in. Boom! I'm like, oh shit! It's hey, man, stone. You know, it, it's it's uh, it's gym time before bros. That's all I, <laughs> I got that shirt. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no. Uh, there there are workarounds, and you know, should be good. So we'll see what happens. You know. Uh, so uh, I'll give an update to all the beefers on the stream tomorrow of how it goes. But I don't expect it to be anything uh, devastating or anything bad. But you know, we'll see. You know, they just hired a new morning show for Mix. Yeah, I heard. I saw he showed me who they were. So Oh, you saw pictures? Yeah. Oh, who? Frank did? Yeah. Oh. Oh, why did he do that? Was that well, he was just, just telling uh, me? He was just like, Oh, look at them. <laughs> yeah. Look at them. Yeah, is it kind of creepy? It's just <laughs> no, no, he, he was just like he was like, I don't know if you heard, but you know, they hired these folks and he said, Look them up and I'm pulled them up on the screen. I'm like, Oh, all right. cool. Yeah, so they've done you know, morning radio before. San uh, Diego or something, right? San Diego and Seattle, so major yeah. markets, and they yeah. moved to Tucson because they were just kind of over it. And they were done. And I actually met the woman in question with Mac several years ago at a parade. Uh, small talk with her. So I was there for the first meeting. And I knew right then and there, you know, during the different turnovers from Mix, that he always had her kind of like at the back, uh, back of his mind. In fact, I think she was in the running uh, with the last opening before Nikki grabbed it. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's just like one of those things where it just sucks for Mike. Because I was Mike. say Mike. Yeah, that's the hard part. Yeah. And so Mike is moving to KLPX middays. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. But at the same time, that's not morning money and that's not afternoon money. Right. So this is a, a way to kind of like, you know, like, say, hey, sorry, you're a victim of circumstance. We're not going to totally screw you over, but we're kind of screwing you over because uh, we won't give you a more lucrative uh, slot to give you you know, decent pay. Uh, midday is going to be a lot less than you would make in afternoons and mornings. It's not like a lateral move. It's kind of like a downward slant a little yeah. bit. It is. Like, huh? It is in a way. Yeah. And it's unfortunate too, because Mac used to do middays and on KLPX, but now he's doing afternoon drive. And I would think, you know, the foresight would be like, okay, well then I would just move Mac back to middays. Um, and then it's a shorter shift for him to deal with because he's doing everything else. Yeah. And then move Mike to the afternoon and everyone's happy. That's why you're not the GM. <laughs> no, because uh, the decisions I make make sense, right? <laughs> they don't like happy. Yeah. <laughs> was... They hate happy. <laughs> For sure. All right. Uh, let's get on the air here. We'll talk a little bit about Scoop, and then we'll get into a beef ship. You ready? Yeah. Okay. And three, two, one. Rock 1 2.1 KFMA. We're almost uh, out of time, but uh, we do want to talk about one more uh, series, I believe, or movie. It's just a movie, yeah, and it's called Scoop. And this is, you guys remember the Jeffrey Epstein thing, right? Obviously, that's hard to forget. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so one of the guys that got caught in the Jeffrey Epstein web more than anybody was Prince Andrew. Okay, so remember, this is this is King Charles now. This is his brother, Andrew, yep. who was good friends with Jeffrey Epstein. And basically what happened was he was keeping it at arm's length pretty well. But then he made the mistake of doing a TV interview with uh, Newsday, which was a BBC channel uh, uh, news program. And this is the story of how that interview happened. And then it sort of ends with that interview. And he just, you know, he really sort of crapped the bed. You know what I mean? He yes, did not he did. do a very good job. I mean, he didn't come out and say, hey, I love you underage girls. But I mean, he... You know, he did not he did not do the a good enough job of saying I screwed up. I shouldn't have been friends with Jeffrey. I'd never met that woman. I would. You know what I mean? He didn't right. pull a Clinton. So anyway, this is a pretty interesting little movie. Uh, Jillian Anderson plays the journalist who does the interview and she's really good in it. She's having a real resurgence. Jillian Anderson. 
Yeah. So, so who plays uh, Prince Andrew? Nobody that I even David recognized. Duchovny? Okay, but <laughs> there no, there is an actor. I know that'd be fantastic if it was Duchovny. But there is an actor playing Prince Andrew. Yes. Uh, does he play do a, an accurate portrayal? Yeah, he's okay. he's definitely aloof and sort of. Um, I think he just uh, d- had no idea the trap he was walking into. You know what I mean? And it wasn't like they were totally being malicious. They were just like, hey, you know, there's 450 layoffs at the BBC. We need to do something big. They swung for the fences. They got this interview. And, you know, like within weeks of this interview, he was stripped of all of his titles and almost removed from the royal family. Yeah. All because of this interview. Right. So, yeah, he messed up. But you know what? Being a creep eventually catches up to you. And that's something that we were learning, uh, sadly, uh, far too late. Is, it, life, is, there a, is there a scene with the queen? Is she like berating him? No, there isn't, just for but, that. But, but he's going up. Like at one point he's going up to see the queen. And, and honestly, the BBC, they're all like until the air, until it actually aired. They're yeah. like, if the queen calls and says, don't air it, we can't air it. And it's wow. like, wow. <laughs> don't you so dare. Like, the queen could have prevented all this. And could have saved her son's ass. She's and, eating and popcorn. She, and she like, left mm-hmm. him. Yep, she yeah. left him out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, She's but you know like, he had it coming. I mean, he, you know, this is terrible. It's terrible. Story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, next thing you're gonna find out, uh, he was also like partying with Diddy. There's a no, <laughs> yeah. no stop to it. just yeah, uh, a low light behavior. The cliffhanger at the end. <laughs> you want to be a bad boy for life? Well, the, I mean, the, the funny uh, irony is that uh, Prince Harry actually has has been to Diddy's parties. Uh, so <laughs> there is that kind of correlation yeah. that people have kind of been pointing out. Harry's oh, made God. some poor choices. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Mm, oh, yeah. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, more scandal for the royal family for sure is uh, yet to come. All right. Well, thank you, Herb. Uh, we're going to wrap things up here on the FM side. Let me give you a beef tip. Uh, your beef tip is five things you should never do if you get pulled over. All right. Uh, so the first thing, don't wait to pull over. You know, if they're right behind you with the lights on, pull over wherever you're at. Right. Uh, don't get out of your car, dummy. All right. Don't hide your hands. Don't reach for anything until they ask. And most importantly, don't panic. It's natural to feel nervous. I'm going to write these down. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm trying to save your life here, Rico, uh, because, you know, cops, they're on the defensive and rightfully so. Uh, so those five things you should never do if you get pulled over. That's your beef tip. Tomorrow morning, uh, Weirdo will be in studio. We'll give away another pair of tickets for Black Keys. And we'll wrap things up uh, for, and have a real fun Friday show for you. So tune in tomorrow morning, bright and early. Till then, Robin Nash is up next. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. Drive safe, ride safe. And as always, rock local. Later. When you wish Clear. upon a sign of doing be this sign-off, so we'll let's do the other sign-off, shall we? Thanks for watching, guys.